Hello, everyone. Welcome to Women of the Military podcast. I'm really excited to be here with Allison today and just to be able to share her story. And she is also a fellow author, so I'm excited to talk about that, too. So welcome to the show, Allison. Thank you, Amanda. Excited to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. So let's start with why did you decide to join the military? Yes, I decided to join the military. I think mostly just I wanted to serve my country um, and be part of something bigger than myself. Um, and that kind of stemmed from uh, an eighth grade history day project, uh, which my topic was women's roles in World War II. Um, I got to uh, um, see firsthand some of their con contributions and I want to do the same. That's really cool. So it was eighth grade. And how did you decide to pick that topic? Was it assigned to you? Or is it something that you were like kind of interested in? How did that work out? Yes, I had learned that my great grandmother was an army nurse in World War II. Um, and so hearing her story and her contribution kind of motivated me uh, to pick that topic to see what other um, efforts women made uh, for that, um, that uh, wartime effort. That's really cool. I've learned so much history about the women of World War II from doing this podcast, and I had no idea until I started this podcast. So I bet that was a fascinating project. So yes. that sounds really cool. I love that. So then you ended up joining the Navy, right? Yes, I ended yeah. up joining the Navy. And so tell us a little bit about that process. Yes, I... Um, I decided I wanted to join the Navy based on the, the Naval Academy. I decided to go there for college. One, I was really interested in getting an engineering degree. I really loved math and science in high school. Um, and the acad all the academies have a great engineering programs. Um, and I felt that that would give me a, a great way to start my military career, uh, as well as the training necessary to be the, a, a great officer when I went, moved to the fleet after graduation. And so did you apply to all the academies or just Annapolis or how did that process go? Yeah, I applied just to Annapolis. Um, I had visited there a few summers. Uh, I grew up playing squash. And so going to squash camp, uh, doing summer seminar at the Naval Academy, seeing the campus, uh, interacting with midshipmen, I uh, just felt like it was a, a great place, uh, a unique experience and uh, ability for me to, to grow as a leader. Okay. So you got in and you, did you play sports while you were there? Yes, I played uh, squash as one of the, I was the only female player on the, the men's JV squash team. So definitely a, a unique experience for me, um, playing with the guys every day and competing against them, with other colleges. Um, but I guess given the male dominated environment, it was nothing out of the ordinary for the Naval Academy. Yeah, it's kind of it to be expected, yeah. Yes. So, and did you do engineering while you were at the academy? Yes, I studied naval architecture and marine engineering. Um, I really liked ship design, um, boats, um, and I, I think I want to do something with that in my future career, but that sparked my interest as maybe Navy oriented um, and uh, worked on a few projects with some robotic sailboats um, and got really close with my, my classmates over some team projects. Uh, I loved it. That's awesome. So is there anything from your time at the Academy that you want to highlight or share before we move on to your career? Um, as far as um, I really just enjoyed getting to know my classmates at uh, the Naval Academy. Um, I think the unique experience built those bonds. Um, I was part of the 13th company. Um, so we were often called Unlucky 13, um, a group of uh, 140 of us per se. Um, and our role was to, to run the football to the Army-Navy game every year. Um, and so uh, I ended up organizing it my senior year. Um, and we we um, ran on foot uh, with some police escorts from um, Annapolis all the way up to, to Philadelphia where the game was played uh, as a way of getting our, our unluckiness off of the, the yard, as they called it. Um, so I, that was definitely a highlight from my time at the academy. I love hearing like traditions and stories and like silly things that different branches and like military academies do. So that's kind of a fun story to be the unlucky 13. I think that's really, that's a fun little tradition and definitely a good way to bond together as a class and, you know, the people in your unit. So that's really cool. Yes. 
So you graduated and what job did you do in the Navy? Yes, I decided to commission as a surface warfare officer. Um, I really wanted to hit the ground running. I wanted the early leadership experience. I didn't want to get stuck in a, a long schooling pipeline or a training pipeline typical of maybe submarines or aviation. Um, I wanted to make an impact early. Um, and so I chose the role of service warfare officer and was stationed on a ship in San Diego, California um, on a, um, a guided missile destroyer, um, the USS Russell. And um, yeah, I was really excited to go to the West Coast growing up on the East Coast. So yeah, yeah, that's an experience. So you went to San Diego, you moved from one side of the country to the other, and you're kind of on your own. It's a bit different to be on active duty than to be at the Naval Academy. So what was that transition like for you? Definitely. It was uh, a lot at first. Uh, I felt like the Naval Academy prepared me um, as far as uh, the leadership, um, education-wise. But yeah, living on your own. Um, my ship was in the shipyard when I first showed up. And so I was expecting just to wear my normal uniform, but I was given hard hat and goggles and um, yeah, earphone or earplugs um, showing up. So it was definitely a different experience from what I was uh, expecting. Um, yeah, I think overall, I think I was definitely benefited from some great mentors early on. Um, I had a, a, a navigator, a female navigator who definitely um, showed me the ropes when I first showed up. Um, as well as a, a few other um, second tours or a little older junior officers, as we called them. Uh, and they definitely helped me, um, you know, get my life together, understand the qualification process and what I needed to do to be successful as a, a young ensign on a, a Navy ship. Yeah. Yeah. And you, so it sounds like you guys were like, they were working on getting the ship ready to go back out to sea. Is that what they were doing? And so, you had that to learn and then you had your job to learn and you had to learn how to, you know, be an adult and make your own meals and do your, do all the things that, you know, in the dorms at the academy, you didn't have to worry about so much. So yeah, that's a lot. Definitely. Yes. It was uh, a lot, definitely balancing, um, being on a ship or going, we would go out to sea for maybe a week or two at a time and come back. And so, you know, your groceries go bad or your car has to be in the right parking spot so it doesn't get towed. So definitely a lot of hands-on learning um, first off. But yes, we uh, were getting the ship ready to, to deploy is the ultimate goal. Yeah, I mean, that adds like a whole other level of dynamics because that's not something people usually think about. Like I... I, my husband travels a lot. So when I go grocery shopping, I have to think like, how much food is he going to eat for his lunches? Because the same thing, like the stuff doesn't last the whole time if he's going to be gone. And so I, but I've been doing grocery shopping for years. And so it's just kind of like part of my natural thing that I have to do. But if you're like in the process of learning, like how much groceries do I get? But then you have to also factor in, I'm not going to be here for two weeks. That would just make it really challenging. Definitely. And the car thing. That doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> no. Uh, thankfully, I only got it towed once. So I uh, I learned my lesson for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, it only takes one time. And then you're like, wait, I got to park in the right spot because I don't want to deal with that again. Yes. So how long were you guys getting everything ready and doing these like little short stints out in the water before you headed out on deployment? Yes, it ended up being about a year in the shipyard um, and then another year of month uh, month on, month at sea and month back in port um, until we uh, deployed again. Um, so I would say about two years in and I was about to embark on my first deployment to the Western Pacific. Wow. And what was that experience like? Yes, I I was excited. I think another reason why I, I joined the surface Navy was I wanted to travel um, and the allure of port visits and uh, of um, Singapore, Japan and Australia, uh, Thailand sounded super exciting to me. Um, we left in January of 2020, unfortunately, um, and COVID struck. So um, my my glimpse of visiting foreign ports was definitely faded. Um, I got 
two nights in Japan. Uh, and after that, we were kind of on lockdown, unfortunately. Um, they didn't want us to get COVID um, because we still needed to accomplish our mission and support the carrier we were, we were with. Um, so definitely, definitely not what I was expecting, staying on a, um, a ship less than two football fields uh, in size um, with 300 people. Uh, we were on one-way P-ways, so we couldn't walk left or right out of a, a room. We had to go just right and basically loop around the entire ship uh, because they didn't want us breathing or hopefully potentially contracting COVID from other members of the crew. Um, so that was definitely a different experience for me. Um, so it, it definitely added a little bit longer to our um, deployment, but we accomplished our mission and we're able to come home safely. Yeah, that's crazy to think about what that experience was like because it's your first deployment. You're so excited. You get to travel the world. And then, you know, a global pandemic hits. And not only do you no longer get to get off the ship and go into the different ports and see the world, you also have to deal with, like, how to navigate all the things that we were kind of trying to deal with stateside, like isolation, but you're on a ship. With all those people, not very much space, and especially like hearing like you're like we had to go left or, and you had to like loop around the ship. I'm like that just seems so crazy. And I they had arrows in like the grocery store, the same sort of thing. But it's just the grocery store. It's not like real life where it's like you have to try and figure it out. So that seems just so crazy. Yes, we like double all of our cleaning stations. So instead of once or twice a day, we were cleaning every hour. It felt like um, we had to wipe down. We get stores and packages at sea from uh, uh, supply ships and, and oil as well. Um, and we had to, to hand wipe down every box and package we received because um, we were fearful that COVID could have come from the, the Navy oiler. Um, so definitely a, a lot more precautions that added to our, our day to day timeline and were you guys able to stay like like without a major outfit outbreak on the ship yes so all this go ahead yes we were um thankfully uh we definitely had a, a good plan in place we had good leadership at the time and and the crew was definitely cooperative um and overall motivated to come back home safely to see their families um and so people stuck to the protocols and yeah, instilled. Um, it did extend us a little bit because we were a clean ship, per se. Um, and so we were stuck out there for a few more months. But um, overall, it was um, a safe, a safe time to be a, at sea. Yeah. So you guys were able to stay safe. And then that kind of not worked against you, but the mission of the Navy, there were other ships that were not able to be out there. And so then you guys stayed out there a little bit longer. Yes, yeah. we did. And then a lot of uh, service warfare officers I talked to, they're able to get their qualifications while they're out over out on a deployment. So were you able to get all the requirements done to get your, is it a SWO badge? Yes, a SWO pin. Yes, I, um, I ended up getting my SWO pin right before we deployed. Um, the ship uh, went up to Alaska for an, a month long exercise um, and I got to complete that before deployment. Um, so I spent the deployment doing some more advanced qualifications, um, standing some some other watch positions, rotations uh, to try to gain proficiency. But yes, being at sea is definitely a good time. There's not much distraction from either um, home life or um, social media and, you know, I guess lack of Internet access and other people to talk to. You're kind of a lot of reading, studying and getting proficient at your job for sure. Yeah, so... I know that deployments for people who are like in like when I was in Afghanistan in 2010, we got Wi-Fi, which was like a big deal. And we had like morale tents. But it sounds like the Navy still has like challenges because you're out at sea. So what is the communication like to talk to people back home? Is it like letters and mail drop or how do you guys communicate with your families? Yes, letters and packages are, are definitely um uh, there and easy. Sometimes there's a month or two delay, but uh, we do get mail. Um, email is probably the most efficient way of communicating. 
um, as well as uh, Facebook, if you can get it to load, um, uh, sometimes without images, so just the messenger portion. Um, but, that, but that will um, sometimes be able to, to uh, connect to the internet. But other than that, it's about it. If we pull into port, um, we'll get you know cell phone service or Wi-Fi in port, but out at sea, we're kind of limited. I have, yeah. yeah, I have heard that aircraft carriers nowadays have Wi-Fi, so that seems like a, a more pleasant experience. Yeah, it's kind of cool how technology is changing and making it so that you can stay connected even out in the middle of the ocean. So that's kind of cool. But I understand we didn't have Wi-Fi until like the last two or three weeks when I left, and like we couldn't. For our work computers, that was what we used. Email was like the only thing because Facebook was blocked and like there was all these other challenges. And so you didn't, we have very limited um, internet access in terms of like social media. And now, and now my friend was FaceTiming her husband in his dorm room. And I was just like, this is crazy because we had to go to the morale tent and wait for a computer. And it was just a whole different experience. So. Wow, good for them though. That's a that's a yeah. good sign that makes deployment a little bit more bearable for sure. Yeah, it's a huge change. And so that's good to hear that things are even changing for the Navy with different opportunities to have Wi-Fi just so you can stay connected and be, you know, it doesn't it's not as hard to be away if you can still stay connected through social media, I think. It's still hard to stay away, but it makes it a little bit easier. So you did that deployment and then you came back. When was it that you came back? Yes, we came back in um, Ju July um, and then we deployed again in November. <laughs> A quick turnaround um, and we were back out again. Um, kind of, we didn't have as many protocols as far as COVID was concerned, um, but we weren't allowed to, to visit any ports again. So uh, definitely brought a lot more books on that deployment. Um, <laughs> a lot more workout equipment that I could bring in my, my room. Um, but yes, more of the same for sure. A lot of sunrises and sunsets at sea. Yeah. So yeah, because we were still in the pandemic, but things were, we knew more information. We have a little bit less restriction and especially if you're not going into ports, it's pretty easy to self isolate the entire ship if you're not doing that. So I like you're like, and I brought more books and more workout stuff because you're like, I know what it's like to be at sea and not to go to port. So I'm going to break all this extra stuff so that I'm not bored out of my mind. Yeah. And you already had your like advanced qualification and all those things that you, so you're like, that's not going to keep me busy. I need to find another way to stay busy. So yes, definitely. Yeah. I, I uh, tried to mentor as many other JOs as possible to help them with their their qualifications and getting their swill pins. Um, and then we ended up getting a, a COVID vaccine at the, the very end of our second deployment. Um, so as we were transiting back east, we were able to, to get the vaccine and pull into port and see our families right away, which is really nice. That is really nice. Instead of having to do like quarantine, is that what you would have had? To... Okay. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's like an added... Like you're home, but you're not home. That would right. be so, so hard. Yeah. That would be really challenging. See, there's like so many challenges I don't think that the general public knows about when it comes to like deployments and especially during the pandemic because it was such a short window. So it only affected, you know, a handful of people who were deployed, but, you know, it affected you guys in so many different ways that it's really fascinating. I'm sure there will be books in the future about what your guys' experience was like, because that's just so many challenges and so unique. Definitely. Yes, it was very challenging getting, if our equipment broke, parts, our technical representatives at sea to assist us fixing our equipment because they couldn't travel. It was really difficult to call them on the phone. Um, and then, yes, if we did pull in and we had something broken, it was very challenging to keep everybody safe from, from COVID when equipment needed to be fixed to, to complete the mission. But yeah. Yeah. That so many challenges. That's so crazy. So how long was this deployment? You said it started in November. Yes. November. And we came back in June again. Okay. So, 
about an you hour. You were out of sea and... for a long time. You're yes. like home for a few months and then they're like, and you're going back out there. You're like, oh, okay. Yes, it's definitely a, a strain on the crew and, and the ship overall. But uh, I guess looking back, it was nice to get it out of the way back to back um, because the ship went back to the shipyard after to get more equipment upgrades. So I, I saw the whole life cycle of the ship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the ship was like, I need a break. <laughs> and everyone else on the ship was like, we need a break. So it worked out really well. So yes. so did you stay there very long after? Or did you move? Did you get out of the military? What happened next in your career? Yes, I stayed with the ship in the shipyard for another year. Um, I oversaw a bunch of uh, missile system and, and air search radar upgrades. Um, and then, yeah, decided to, to separate from the military to pursue some civilian career goals. Um, and I left the military in August of 2022. Um, so a little over a year ago. Um, and my main, I guess, motivation was more autonomy over my, my career path, um, more say in, in the jobs I wanted to do. Um, and then I think some, I, I want to be a leader in the business world. And so I think that was really the, the driving factor of, of why I wanted to, to separate. Yeah, that makes sense. You had different goals and different passions and the military doesn't always let you do what you want to do. They're like, no, you're over here. And especially if you're in like a high demand career field, like a surface warfare officer, like it's hard to do different things because it's the needs of the Navy unlike the needs of the human being. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Yeah. So by August, the pandemic was pretty much over and the world was fairly back to normal. So what was the transition out of the military like? Were you able to find a job quickly? What was that whole experience like? Yes, the transition is is kind of like a black box, I would definitely say. I um, definitely a lot of planning on my part. Uh, I think I'm very organized and so trying to get as much information as i could prior to to taking those actions is my my going in mindset um it's challenging i, I wonder if you felt the same like you who do you turn to you don't know who to ask um because everyone who had gotten out they're gone and you, if you're not close with them it's hard to ask them those questions of what they would have done better or how they would have made the process smoother um, but I think no matter how much planning I did for the transition, it was kind of a sprint at the last minute, um, less than paperwork or travel plans and, um, physically moving, um, definitely happened all, all pretty last minute. Um, I, uh, ended up leaving, uh, the Navy and then immediately attending graduate school. So, um, right now I'm, um, uh, studying towards my MBA at the Wharton School um, in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so I, I kind of thought my thought process was going to school would kind of bridge my gap um, and help me pivot more towards um, a civilian career rather than go straight from the military into a civilian job. Um, so, yeah, halfway through my my uh, education right now um, and it's going well so far. Yeah. And were you able, I can talk, and were you able to utilize the GI Bill? Because I, I don't know the, yeah, okay. I was like, there used to be like rules on like who got the GI Bill and all the different things. So you were able to use your GI Bill. Yes. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, that makes the transition even a little bit smoother because you have a little bit of money and your schooling's paid for. And so it's not, you know, like an abrupt end to like, you know, everything and you don't have to take as many student loans because you have that support. And so that's, that's really good. Or maybe you don't have to take any depending on how well you're able to use the GI Bill. And so that's really cool. So, so you got out in August and then school started like right away. There was kind of no, <laughs> no, no time off. No, if I were to do it all over again, I definitely would have given myself a month or two of a break um, in order to finish that move and, you know, get my, my mind in the right spot to start school um, on time. But um, Penn has a lot of uh, veterans that attend school. Um, and so it's, I found it's a great community of people to, that have that shared experience. 
Um, and I think Philadelphia overall is a, a large city. And so there's definitely a lot of veterans communities in, in the area. And I have definitely found that important with the overall transition. Yeah. Have you gotten involved in Student Veterans of America? I know that they're on college campuses, a lot of places, and I've heard good things about them. No, I haven't, but I'm going to look into that. Yeah. See if there's a chapter there, because I've heard really good things, and they even have a conference every year. Um, but they are a really great organization for veterans who are going to school to help find that community, which it sounds like you've started to find that, but maybe even get more plugged in there, because they're, they're just doing so much to help veterans as they're going to school. So it's great. Yeah. It's great to hear. And then you're going to school, but you also published a book that I had a chance to read. Um, and it's similar, but very different to a girl's guide to military service. So you, can you talk a little bit about why you created the book and yeah. And that's, we'll start there. Yes. I, I started writing it while um, I was uh, my last year in the Navy. Um, and I kind of put it aside to kind of think it through as I, actually transitioned out and, and lived that experience um, before I went back to review and, and edit. Um, I My motivation to write it was mostly, I felt like I had great mentors and, and support throughout my entire military career, um, whether that was uh, the Naval Academy, picking surface warfare, or um, on my ship, um, my, a few of my bosses helped me decide what career path I wanted to do next. Um, we get different jobs assigned to us on board the ship. Um, and so uh, deciding what job I wanted. Um, and I think uh, I was definitely very fortunate to have people like that um, throughout my career. Uh, and I realized that um, some of my peers maybe didn't have that or might have been on type of a maybe autopilot of letting the military kind of dictate their their next career move or their life choices. Um, and. I didn't want that for them. I wanted them to kind of be empowered to make their own career decisions, accomplish their goals. Um, I mean, their goals could be aligned with the military 100%. Um, and I just wanted to provide my experience and my advice um, to them as they try to start their career, um, determine uh, what they want to get out of the career, either pivot to a different branch or um, a different billet. Um, and then if they decide to transition out or uh, retire, you know, how do they actually make that transition and, and what do they need to know prior to physically separating? Yeah, I thought it was a really concise, easy way to have like all the bullet, you know, checkpoints of what you need to know for each thing. And so I thought it was a really good organized thing and especially for like people who are like even if you've like already joined the military but you're like trying to figure out how to figure out where things are and what things you need to think about for the future I feel like it did a really good job of <clears throat> making it so that you could start thinking about it if you were already in and you were like just you know on autopilot I like you said you know, they're like, oh, these are things I can take control of. These are things I need to start thinking about for the future. And so I thought it was really great. Can you say the name of the book? Yeah, I... it's called Sharp Start. Um, and there the subtitle is the Ultimate Junior Military Officer Development Guide. Um, and yeah, I to the, to the point of the bullets, I think it's definitely useful to have conversations with friends, um, whether that be in your, um, in your, we called it a wardroom, kind of where we ate ate lunch or meals um, and did briefs um, or your, you know, your, your uh, units hangout area um, as a way to kind of spark that and, and, and start talking about, you know, mentorship or networking and, and career choices. And, you know, the more you talk to people about that stuff, the more you learn about areas they've researched or that you've researched um, to try to, to spread the knowledge as much as, much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And you talked about your transition, like you didn't have people who, you know, like people had left and then you lost contact with them. And so then when you were leaving, you, you didn't have that mentorship. And so I think more people on active duty need to start thinking about like, what people do they know? That's why LinkedIn is like a really great place to be connected because you can find veterans there. And the transition process, as much as you prepare for it, there's things that you just don't know until you experience it. But if you can talk to a veteran who has gone through it, they can give you tips and advice and 
um, you know, like make sure that when you go to college, you go to Student Veterans of America because that's a great organization. But if you don't, if you've never heard of it, then you don't even know to look for it and how are you supposed to find it? Um, so I think, I think it's really cool that you're giving back and helping people with something that you found valuable through your experience. So I, I commend you for the work that you're doing. That's really awesome. Thank you. Yes, I really enjoyed writing it. Um, definitely, you know, thinking back and, and having some friends read it and family read it. It's definitely, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the process overall of actually putting it together too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a healing process to write, you know, your story and to look back at your career. And so that that makes sense. I can, I, that resonates with me. So, yeah. So are there anything, anything from your career or from your transition that we didn't get a chance to talk about that you want to highlight? Hmm. Yeah, I think just, just overall, you know, it's, it's kind of your, your path. Um to people who are listening and and just try to ask those questions and have conversations with as many people as possible. Um, as I think at the time I didn't I didn't know how grad school would fit in my my future and through talking to some people who who did that in the past definitely um, helped me stay focused and and gave me that opportunity. So yeah definitely use people at your commands or outside of your commands or if you're thinking about joining the military, you know talking to active duty and veterans and try to get that whole perspective for sure. Yeah. And you kind of jumped ahead and answered a little bit of my advice question, but do you have any last minute or last advice for someone who's considering joining the military? Yes. I, I think that the best advice I could give is probably to, to remember your why. Um, I think you wrote about it in your book, Amanda. Um, definitely resonated with me. Um, I think having that why definitely helped me throughout the Naval Academy or on deployment or away from family and friends. Um, and so just remembering that why is, is really what's going to get you through those hard times. Um, and so if you can really solidify that before you join, uh, I think you'll have great success. Yeah. And you even touched on your why when you were talking about why you left the military, because you were thinking about like what you wanted for your future and your why from when you were, you know, 17, 18, joining the Naval Academy to, you know, I guess eight, 10 years later had changed. And so it was like my like the why that gets you into the military or helps sustain you through can change over time. And so that why is really important, but it also can change as like you grow up, as you start a family, like all the different things that happen in your life can change. And so you're still using that guiding principle of like, why do I want to do this? And how do I get to where I want to be and figuring out that. So I love hearing how that resonates through your whole story, even as you transition and go and do amazing things after the military. So that's really awesome. Thank you. So thank you so much for your time. I'm really glad we got to talk. And if you know someone who is joining the military or attending a military academy or in ROTC, make sure they go get out, go out and get Sharp Start. I can talk today. I don't know what's wrong with me, but <laughs> your book is great and they could get Girl's Guide too. But yeah, I think the two books companion really well together. And so I'm really excited that we got to meet and that we got to connect. So thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda.